call the meeting in order of the Wilmington City Council. I'd like to welcome all those who are with us there this evening and all those who are watching us at home. Thank you for taking an interest in your government. At this time, I'd like to welcome everyone and introduce Joe Michael James of the Wilmington Fire Captain for the invocation and ask if everyone will remain standing afterwards for the Pledge of Allegiance. Joe Michael. Is he here? Let's pray. God, thank you for protection. Thank you for this beautiful day that you've given us as we work here um, to make our community and our city and our world a better place to live. Thank you for the privilege to serve you by serving others. Bless our time together, for it's in his name I pray. Amen. Amen. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. First order of business is a consent agenda. Items one through eight. Are there any items that any council member would like to hear separately? If not, what are the wishes of this council? We have a motion. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, Ms. Spears, did you mean to hit that? Yeah, I need um, C, what is it? Hold on a second. We got this. We got this new. Um, it's the consent agent item where the police department and the housing authority. Yeah. C5. Is that it? I guess my phone, I hadn't downloaded the new city of Wilmington website, C5. C5, okay. Uh, we have a motion to approve excluded item C5. Mayor Pro Tem has made the motion, second by Councilmember Waddell. Discussion, all in favor of that motion, please indicate by saying aye. 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 There we go. Any opposed? Item passes unanimously. At this time, I'd like to recognize Councilmember Spears. Ms. Spears? Yeah, and I So, can we get some insight on this resolution authorizing the interlocal agreement between the Wilmington Housing Authority and the City of Wilmington to assign three Wilmington police officers to Wilmington Housing Authority with a impact of $158,000 to be reimbursed by WHA? Yes, sir. Do you have some sort of presentation or some sort of information that you might want to provide? No, sir. Just the information that was provided with the item in the packet. We'll be glad to answer any questions you may have. Well, I, uh, I see we've got a... Uh, we've got Captain okay. Tillman here. If he's got, if you've got specific questions. Well, I, just, just enlighten us. In, enlighten the audience as to what this means. Well, this is a contract between the Woman ha Wilmington Housing Authority and the City of Wilmington to provide police services uh, with three officers. And you have the budgetary impact amount here to the Wilmington Housing Authority. <clears throat> Pardon me. Woo been a long day y'all it's been real hot uh, to the to the city of Wilmington WHA properties in Wilmington so they provide police services so the housing units under me and they're providing police services in the housing projects in the city of Wilmington okay housing housing under you so you're, you're over you're over housing that is correct okay so but what, just, just three additional officers to, to do what? Do the police in the housing projects. Okay, housing projects, but I mean, what are, what are they doing? What is the nature of, of the services that they're providing? Just to, I mean, come on, give me some insight as for, to, to the citizens to, to so what's going to take place. housing pl projects calls 911. Typically when the housing officers are on duty, they'll respond to those calls for service and they'll answer those calls for service. So. They'll take reports, they'll respond to assist EMS. They will do crime prevention. They're there to make sure that the, the peace is maintained. Uh, they respond to shootings, uh, shot spotter activations, if those happen in the, in the project. So basically, it's no different than any other patrol officer we have, but their specific area assignment is housing, period. So are there only three housing? No, there's several more housing officers but they're, they're also deputies on these task force. We have a task force and an MOU agreement with the New Hanover County Sheriff's Office, and we provide police services with the New Hanover County Sheriff's Office and the Wilmington Police Department to people that live in those housing communities through these contracts. These contracts have existed through the city of Wilmington for several years. Okay. So, so you would say this is to provide a, a, a level of safety in our community? Yes. 
And, and how long has this been going on? My whole career. And how long have you 30 served? Years. 30 years? Yes. Okay. So I am happy to have you in front of me. I want to ask you a few questions. Do you know anything about um, uh, police officers for Safer Wilmington? You know anything about that? I do. You a member of that group? I, so in 2013, I spoke before this body at the city council. And uh, yes, I was a member of that group at that time. Are you originator of that group? I was one of the originators of that group, yes. Oh, okay. So that, that's a group of Wilmington police officers? That's correct. And, and so I, I'm going I'm to help you. I'm going I'm to ask you to help me, Mr. Manager. So there was um, maybe two weeks ago. No, not two weeks ago. When was the last meeting that we had? A month ago. A month ago. We, um, we made a de decision to, um, we had to approve the budget for fiscal year 25. Yes, sir. And in that budget, there were uh, raises brought about. And, and so, do you know how that vote went as it, as it was concerned, staff and raises and, and anybody for the city of Wilmington? Did we, did we approve raises? Did we, did we yes, not? Yes, you did. We did? Yes. So as a, as a member of that group and as a member of the Wilmington Police Department, uh, are you not satisfied with the raises that were received? Well, I have to say, when you say that I'm a current member of that group, I'm not. In 2013, we formed that group to speak to city council. I'm not a current member of that group. You're not, I do know of the group, and I was a member of it when we started in 2013, but I'm not currently a member of that group. I made no post to that group. I have no affiliation with that group currently. Oh, okay. Point of order, Mr. Mayor, what does this have to do with the well, I, Mr. Hidden Mr. item C Mr. File? Waddell, I still have the floor. No, yeah, there's a point of order, so no, you don't. Well, this point of order, I'm, I'm, I'm talking to Officer Tillman yeah. about a, a, a concern with the Wilmington Police Department and this governing body where I was framed as or depicted as a person that was stopping or capping raises and this group of police officers are upset about it. And, and I know the mayor was also named in that, but I was quoted as saying that, and I did say that I don't believe that people are leaving their jobs for one or two dollars. And I still stand by that. I don't believe that a person who works for any company and is offered a dollar or two will up and leave their job for just one or two dollars. But I also wanted to say that as long as I've been a member of the Wilmington City Council, I have been adamant about showing support for the Wilmington Police Department. I understand what you're saying. I, I, Mayor Sappho, you recall in, 20, in 2013 when I spoke before this board, sir, it, it, it wasn't anything personal. At the time, we had been through an economic crisis. In 2009, we hadn't had raises for four years, and we were losing a lot of officers. I lost my primary detective at the time, Melisande Manning, and she was a, a, a senior member of, of the police department. And we lost her to, uh, to Seattle, Washington, for three times the amount of pay that we were paying her here. And I thought that was a travesty. And I spoke before this board so in the hopes that we would be raising our pay in 2009, or 2013, I apologize for misspeaking, in 2013, to raise our pay so that we wouldn't lose more Melisan Mannings. That was why that group was created. Now, I am no longer a member of that group. I'm a captain of the Wilmington Police Department. I represent the city of Wilmington Police Department and the chief. I'm not a member of that group. I don't post in that group. I'm not affiliated with that group in any way whatsoever. In 2013, I was. Mayor Sappho was the mayor when I spoke, and it was unfortunate because I think the mayor and I had a good relationship prior to me speaking at that city council meeting, and I think our relationship was soured as a result of my speaking out at that meeting. But as far as that group goes today, I'm not affiliated with it in any way whatsoever. I, I appreciate that. But if your relationship is sour with the mayor, I, I, don't, I, don't have a, I don't think I have a relationship with you. In fact, let me take that back. I know I don't have a relationship with you. I don't, probably don't have a relationship with anybody that's in that group. But, but my point is to say this. If anybody in that group felt a way about the decision that was made, which I thought was a positive decision 
as we move this city forward, as we move this organization forward, I would hate, and, and I do hate for a person that would hide behind fake names, fake pages, to attack not only me in this capacity, but also members of my family. I'm not hiding behind any fake names, and I, I, uh, I'm kind of angry at that insinuation. Well, you can be angry. I'm angry, too. I, I'm, I'm angry, and, and I waited for this opportunity to express in the most positive way. And not only to you, sir, if you're not, if you're not involved in that group, then as being a former member or current member or whatever you are, you can take this message back to anybody that owns that page or who is a member of that page who, who could not see the positivity that is being brought forth from the person that sits in this seat on these meetings on Tuesday nights. I'm certainly grateful as the captain of the Wilmington Police Department that this city council saw fit to give our employees raises this year. And I thank you for the budget that y'all passed that included okay. the raise package for the Wilmington Police Department. All right. So I, I just wanted to, to express that, and, and I didn't want to hide behind uh, something fake. And, and, and again, I would say, well, not again, but if it wasn't something negative, then why would the people who orchestrated the post block me from the post where I couldn't see it, where I was being called clowns, I, no I was being called clowns and, and all kind of negative things. Put of order, Mr. And, Mayor. And, and, this has not gone long, long enough. This is embarrassing. No, it, and it has nothing to do, it's, it's not germane it, it's with the items that's in front it's of us. It's also embarrassing how, how you seem to be, you're the one who opposes some of the things that this Wilmington Police Department, the chief, brings forward, and you attempt to block it. I never have. Okay. All right. Okay. We have a motion to approve by Councilmember Waddell. We have a second to that. We have a second by Councilmember Ravenbark. Discussion. All in favor of that motion, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Unanimously. That brings us to our next item of business, which is our public information. We have um, six, one, two, three, four, five, six speakers that have signed up to speak this evening. Each speaker will be allotted five minutes. First speaker is Miss Patty Moore, who would be speaking to us about a ceasefire resolution. Each speaker will be allotted five minutes, and the clerk will be keep keeping time. My name is Patty Moore. I'm a Wilmington resident here to discuss a ceasefire resolution in the Israeli-Palestinian Lebanon crisis. You might wonder while I'm talking to you, a city council, about a part of the world that is 6,000 miles away. The reason is the region many call holy matters in the hearts of all the monotheistic religions, Christianity, Islam, and Judaism. What happens there matters to all of us, the way we see each other and in the way we get along. We must have respect for one another. Listen, I was devastated by October 7th. I saw it was a catastrophe, not only for the victims of that day, but for the world. I felt partly responsible because I have been to that area and saw that a crisis was brewing. I did not do enough to call attention to the injustices taking place. I saw the dehumanization by the military occupation of one people controlling another. I saw the apartheid system that blocks locals from driving on streets reserved for the settlers. I met children who were afraid to be Palestinian because that alone could get them beaten or worse, killed. I saw that the Abraham Accords with Arab countries sidelined the Palestinian cause. It wasn't a peace plan, it was an arms deal. What's more, I saw that the injustices were not being addressed. I've known for a long time about the injustices taking place and they wouldn't be possible without the unconditional US support for one side, Israel. As a news reporter in Washington DC, I witnessed the silencing of information and censorship of moderate Palestinian voices. For decades, the world has tried to force Israel to recognize Palestinian rights. They've tried to force Israel to comply with international law. They failed due to one reason, vetoes by the United States of America in the UN Security Council. The United States has vetoed 89 resolutions related to this issue since 1945. 
As a result, things keep getting worse. Washington is one-sided and that fuels extremism. I just returned from DC where APAC has spent over 17 million in the 2024 election cycle alone. Our representatives in Congress say they stand with Israel no matter what it does. Washington is broken. It no longer supports human rights. It doesn't stand for democracy or even human life. In the past nine months, we've witnessed the worst atrocities in, against mankind in most of our lifetimes. It won't end until we demand that it ends. What chance of survival do the Palestinians have? It is not just the millions in Gaza who are barely alive. It's also the millions in the West Bank subject to settler terrorism. And it's millions of Palestinians in Israel whom the finance minister calls the front line of the war. How do you think it feels to see the United States government say some lives matter while others clearly don't? It's unsettling and it hurts. It sets a terrible tone for what can happen right here. Fascism is on the horizon. We need to decide, are we going to be the America that enslaved people or the one that freed them? Are we going to be the racist America that denied rights or the one that stands for liberty and equality? Everyone should be speaking up, condemning crimes against humanity and war crimes, calling for them to stop. It matters to our community. We must have a ceasefire now. We must say all lives matter. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> Next speaker is Mr. Amajan Ike. Ike? Ike, gotcha. We'll be speaking to us about humanity and peace activism. Good evening, everyone. My name is Amjad Aik. I've been here a couple of times before. I spoke uh, in details about situations that uh, are happening back home. Uh, as we all know, it's a very dire situation. Uh, I must tell you that uh, uh, I am very traumatized by what's going on. Uh, and this is not lightly said. Uh, I'm here tonight to speak a bit about the relevancy of our situation. Uh, like Mr. Joyner said, it is not relevant to the city to discuss this matter, or it might be not relevant for a city to, this, to stand up on a matter like that. Now, I would say that it is. It is absolutely matter that a city of this stature will be standing uh, and calling against something that is uh, globally not acceptable, hum humanely not acceptable, and especially as you guys are the gate to the government. Uh, we are the constituents, and you are our closest uh, people that we can speak to. Uh, so uh, we would like uh, that ma to manifest that into something positive. Uh, now, uh, the situation is dire, as you all know. Uh, I haven't prepared any speech or anything of that sort. Uh, we, are, we, we are not creating any animosity here. Uh, we are approaching you as people. And we, we would like uh, uh, your support. Uh, the situation is beyond dire, and you became aware of that. We have brought to you many uh, things, uh, to, uh, many proofs to show you. I mean, the facts are on the ground. The involvement of, of uh, this country uh, in the war is obvious. I mean, the United States provide the weapons. So uh, this is a very dire situation. So we're just asking for uh, a stance by the city uh, officials uh, toward uh, resolving this matter, at least symbolically, by standing up and asking for uh, the resolution. Uh, now it's going to be voted on, of course. And uh, uh, it is a very, very hard situation for me. Uh, and not only for me, for many other people that are related to this matter. It is hard for me to see the division that we have in this country, the division that is uh, really tearing us apart. Uh, and we are losing the ground over what is really important. The real things that are important are unity 
and our unity here is defined by law as well. Uh, we, we all celebrate that. Uh, and uh, it seems like a lot of things are deteriorating, but we are here still alive and we can change things. So uh, I would like to, uh, for a change, just would like you to listen to uh, a precious child speaking. That will give you a bit of a perspective uh, over the matter. So if you don't mind. Where, you, where do you live, Jenna? In Gaza. And how, how has Gaza been in the last no, few days? Not very good. What's been happening? In the morning, in the night, there's lots of bombing. And we have to worry about our safety. And with safety, it's like it's slowly, 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 slowly falling. And if we hear some loud noise, I get scared. to hear what she's talking about. Those are not regular bombs. Those are made in the United States. Those bombs are powerful. They destroy a whole quarter. Um, like, uh, we need to start thinking about things constructively, you know? Like, you, you see, uh, uh, like, uh, the, uh, Nikki Haley, uh, she goes and uh, uh, send messages on a bomb that is going to be sent to kill people. And uh, what an honorable thing to do. I wish she could have picked up a couple of bombs and took it home with her as a souvenir. That would be something really great, especially when we pay for it. So she, she's eligible, you know. Uh, so the situation is very dire. We, we are, uh, like, the ceasefire is uh, hopefully about to, to come uh, uh, to fruition eventually, hopefully, in a month or two. I pray to God it will, because uh, it is too traumatizing for me and for many of us. Uh, I, I think uh, what is in stake here for you, gentlemen and ladies, is uh, your legacy. Your legacy is at stake. So your stance on the matter is, 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 uh, uh, is very important to you, for you guys, all of you. Uh, we are all humans, we're all the same, we differ. We differ with cultural things, and, and that will ma makes us powerful, and that brings us strength, you know? So we, we should be a little bit more practical uh, in this matter. It is, uh, you know, again, it is your legacy at stake. In my case now, I almost lost hope, really. Uh, so thank you so much. Thank you, sir. And uh, hopefully things will come. Thank through. you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Next person is Ms. Heba. Eunice, meeting the needs of the people of Wilmington. Heba, Miss Eunice in? Miss Eunice? Okay. Next speaker is Miss Jeanette Carlin. Please speak to us about a ceasefire resolution. Good evening. My name is Jeanette Carlin. I'm a resident uh, of Wilmington. I'd just like to say a few words um, in support of the ceasefire resolution our coalition has brought forward. Following Hamas's attack on October 7th, Israel has been on a purported campaign to destroy Hamas. This mission has been a heinous genocide of Gaza with an Israeli campaign that has killed over 39,000 Gazan civilians at the hands of the U.S.-funded Israeli Defense Forces. A wholesale destruction of Gaza has leveled cities, homes, schools, universities, hospitals, churches, mosques, and infrastructure, leaving Gaza a wasteland. The Israeli military refused to facilitate deliveries of much needed aid in reaching Gaza and killed more than 250 aid workers since October 7th. 
A panel of UN independent experts recently declared in an open letter that Israel's engaged in a campaign of starvation and genocide in Gaza. As a descendant of Palestinian immigrants, I feel deep sorrow and indignation for the Palestinian people for their horrifying experience. I grieve the loss of Palestinian and Israeli lives. The Israeli response to Hamas's attack has gone very much beyond a self-defense. These are war crimes. Recent events must also be seen in the context of decades of displacement, dispossession, oppression, and marginalization of the Palestinian people who have lived under military occupation and apartheid conditions for decades. Palestinians have been refugees since 1948. Millions of people are now refugees in their own territory of Gaza, walking from one end of Gaza to the other by order of the IDF to evade being bombed. Gazans have moved on foot with all of their belongings, hungry and ill, only to come under attack again in shelters and tent camps in their new location. Over the weekend, in a city in northern Gaza, in the only safe zone officially designated by the Israeli government, 90 Gazans were massacred and over 300 injured in a carpet bombing-like offensive with five 2,000-pound bombs. These come from the U.S. Last week, the IDF ordered 400,000 Palestinians, Palestinian residents and refugees of Gaza City to evacuate. That's more than three times the population of Wilmington. They proceeded to destroy most of the city, which now lies in ruins. At each city council meeting since January, we've heard a new tally of the casualties in Gaza. It's important to remember these numbers were individuals with lives, families, fears, hopes, and dreams. How can we forget five-year-old Hind Rajab executed by Israeli forces in her family's car? She survived the initial close-range tank attack that killed six family members and lay for her last living three hours among their dead bodies while begging for help by phone from the Palestinian Red Crescent and her mother. Imagine if this had been a story about your daughter or your granddaughter. Among the innocent civilians killed by Israeli forces were more than 10,000 Palestinian children, half of whose names and ages are listed in these 98 pages, beginning with infants. The first thousand names listed did not see their first birthday. I'd like to leave a copy of these names with the city clerk for you today, if that's okay, as well as seven copies of the first five pages of this long list of names. Do I have your permission? Yes, Thank you. <clears throat> we know that many of these children suffered tragic, lonely deaths buried beneath hundreds of tons of cement rubble from structures demolished by Israeli airstrikes. The U.S. sent $12.5 billion in aid to Israel since October. Funding violence takes us away from diplomacy and peace-building programs that could potentially bring people together to solve problems. That is why I urge you to join the more than US, uh, 100 U.S. cities in sending a ceasefire resolution to Washington. This would essentially be saying enough. My grandparents emigrated to the U.S. from Palestine in the 1940s. I imagine their sense of excitement and comfort as they first laid eyes on the Statue of Liberty representing freedom for all. Mayor Sappho, you honorably gave a speech recently at the U Ukrainian festival calling for the freedom of Ukrainians. Our government's treatment of Ukraine and Palestine um, are in stark contrast with each other. Just outside in the side lawn of this city hall building, the inscription on a plaque commemorates those who have dedicated or will dedicate their lives, quote, to answer the call to preserve liberty for all mankind, end quote. Palestinians are a part of all mankind, and our money, port, and weapons are stripping them of their most basic freedoms, their human rights, and their right to life itself. So I ask you, what are we empowered to do as a city? Are we empowered to stand for liberty for all mankind? We demand an immediate and permanent ceasefire, denounce this gross violation of human rights, demand the provision and allowance of humanitarian aid into Gaza, and basic human and civil rights for the Palestinian people. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Next speaker is Mr. Don D'Angio. Angio? D'Angio? Toys for Novon and Sexual Assault Children. Thank you. My name is Tom D'Angelo. I've been building these toys for the emergency room 
for the past five years. I don't charge for them. I donate them. Happy to do it in my heart. Through this, I have met this young lady. She is the director of the sexual assault section and Jill Heath over at the, um, help me out here, Carousel. the Carousel Center for Children. They have asked me to see if I could supply them as well. I live on Social Security. But I want to meet the demand. And I want to continue to do it. But I need some help financially. I've got all the tools to build them, and I love building them. I work in my shop probably three to four hours a day, okay? Home Depot has stepped up their plate down at uh, Monkey Junction, and they're helping me with the wood, applying the three-quarter inch pine that I need to build them. I need clear pine because I can't have knots in these because of the kids. But I, router bits, bandsaw blades, drill bits. These are the toys. Uh, they're just getting, I'm spending over $200 a month of my own money. I just need some it's guidance some guidance from the council as to where I can get some help. These guys are just, what they do over at that hospital is sad. She works closely with the police department. She works closely with the DA's office to try and get these predators off the street and help these kids. Just, if you can just give me some direction, <laughs> would be appreciated. By the way, she's my daughter, and I'm proud of her. <laughs> Thank you. No problem. I will say real quick, um, kids making it, if you haven't spoken to them, I think they are a great organization, and they have, they, um, have a lot of kids that come into the community that they help to make these types of um, toys and other things. And uh, I don't know who the executive director is there right now, but they are a great organization that I know would love to help in, in this endeavor. And um, kids making it on Castle Street, I don't have the number right now of me, but we can get it to you. If you just my could. Phone, my phone number's on that sheet. You can text me or, or whatever help you guys can send my way. I we'll do that. You. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. And our last speaker this evening is Mr. John Bauer, who will be speaking to us about a resolution requesting ceasefire in Palestine. Is Mr. Bauer, you're there. Honorable Mayor, City Council, and City Manager, these meetings begin with a prayer. I believe prayer works, and I'm certain you are not just going through the motions. I prayed for the wisdom to say the right things this evening. As written, the document entitled Resolution Calling for a Ceasefire and Humanitarian Aid in Gaza is not one which is appropriate to consider and adopt. I communicated specific changes to the group of volunteers which drafted it. It needs to be simplified, rewritten, and submitted for your vote. My humble request this evening is for the Wilmington City Council to authorize and direct the city manager's staff to work with this volunteer group to prepare a resolution which would be placed on the agenda and acceptable to vote on. What local government would not be in favor of passing a resolution which called for a ceasefire, humanitarian aid, and peace in Palestine? According to a Google ceasefire resolution tracker, 56 jurisdictions have rejected such resolutions, but 172 jurisdictions across the country have passed such resolutions, including Durham, Greensboro, Carboro, and Boone. If you adopt such a resolution, Wilmington would be joining the vast majority who have positively acted. Now, an argument against passage of such a resolution would be its irrelevancy or relevancy to city business. Well, sometimes the mayor, council, and staff do take up matters which have no relevancy to police, fire, public works, parks and recreation, etc. I am proud of Wilmington's mayor who leads songs and lights the city's Christmas tree. Maybe that's why he's been elected 
a record number of times for his voice. I am proud of the city administration, which removed Confederate statues in the early morning hours without fanfare. There are other examples, I am sure, where the business relevancy of an issue is not used as an excuse for taking action or not. Sure, a ceasefire resolution may be tilting at windmills. None of us are naive enough to believe that approval of such a resolution will change the course of history. United Nations resolutions and State Department diplomacy have had minimal effects. Years from now, no one will remember what you did or didn't do. Ultimately, whatever is in your hearts will determine the resolution's fate up or down. But hopefully, your hearts include, blessed are the peacemakers, for they, are, they shall be called the children of God. Christ's words from Matthew, verse 9 of the Beatitudes. I served overseas for five years with the U.S. Department of State on district stabilization teams in Iraq and Afghanistan. I was an enabler for the U.S. military and a civilian advisor to local leaders, coaching them on the effective and efficient operations of local governments. I saw firsthand that peoples in the Middle East and Middle Asia have minimal material wealth, whether they be Jews, Muslims, Christians, or other faiths. The folks in Palestine have even less now and fewer lives. In conclusion, a concise, properly prepared and approved ceasefire resolution would represent a positive prayer for peace by you, the elected leaders of the city of Wilmington. Do the righteous thing. Do what we pray for. Please act upon my request. Thanks for listening to us. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Brings us to our next item of business, which is our public hearings. Item PH1 is an ordinance amending the official zoning maps of the city of rezone property containing 1.79 acres of land located at 1618 Dawson Street from UMX Urban Mixed Use District to CSCD Commercial Services Conditional District for general retail use with accessory fuel pumps. At this time I'd like to recognize our city manager, Mr. Caldwell. Mr. Caldwell. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, members of council. Patrick O'Mahaney, who is a planning manager with the department, will overview this item for us. Uh, good evening, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, members of council. Uh, as mentioned, this site is located along the south side of Dawson Street uh, between 16th and 17th Streets uh, and contains approximately 1.79 acres. Uh, and it currently includes a vacant commercial structure. Uh, this map shows the site within the surrounding area, uh, and these are photos of the existing conditions of the subject property. Uh, these are photos of the subject site, uh, looking uh, along Dawson Street, South 17th Street, South 16th Street, and the existing conditions. And here are some more photos. These are of uh, adjacent properties within the vicinity of the site. Um, as mentioned, the site is currently, <clears throat> excuse me, is currently in an area that is zoned UMX, urban mixed use. Um, there is commercial zoning located to the east along South 17th Street. Uh, the applicant is proposing to rezone this, this site from the existing UMX district to a commercial services uh, CS conditional district. Uh, this is for a general retail use with accessory fuel pumps. <clears throat> Here's the proposed site plan. Uh, the project is proposing the demolition of the existing structure and the construction of a one-story 5,200 square foot structure and fuel canopies with 14 associated fuel pumps. Uh, access to the site uh, is provided uh, along the existing driveways along 16th and 17th Street. Um, with two additional driveways uh, located along Dawson Street, a right in, right out uh, configuration as shown on the plan. Um, this may look familiar to council. Uh, this item was brought forth on February 6, 2024. Uh, this was a request to rezone to CBCD, Community Business Conditional District. Uh, this was denied by council at that meeting. Uh, there's a 3-3 vote 
um, and this was for the same use. Um, the applicant has submitted the revised site plan that is shown on your screen uh, with some changes to the plan, uh, including the changing of the zoning district that was proposed, uh, going from the original proposal, which was the CB uh, community business, to the CS, which is now proposed. Um, this also includes a um, private open space feature, which you can see on the um, top left or northwest corner uh, of the site plan. Um, there's also uh, been a removal of the ATM, which was originally proposed as part of the proposal back in February. Um, a traffic impact analysis as similar with the, the previous request is not required uh, due to the large number of pass-by vehicle trips associated with this use, uh, which would account for the majority of the trip generation for the site. Uh, these are the proposed elevations uh, provided by the applicant. Uh, the Great Wilmington Comprehensive Plan identifies this site as within a urban mixed-use center and post-industrial and inner-city revitalization area of opportunity. Uh, the Comprehensive Plan calls for infill development that enhances the desired character of the area. Uh, the plan also supports building and site designs for urban conditions that foster safe and pedestrian activity. Um, the proposed rezoning would allow for uh, compatible infill development. Um, it would also replace a blighted vacant building uh, and provide for needed investment along an important commercial corridor. Uh, the proposal includes a site-specific development plan and building elevations that ensure an improved or urban form um, and also increase vehicular and pedestrian safety for the site. Uh, staff believes this request is consistent with the comprehensive plan um, and that it's reasonable in the public interest and recommends conditional approval. Uh, Planning Commission also unanimously recommended approval at their June meeting. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, the applicant's here as well. Thank you. Okay. Any questions from council? Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Just like to recognize the applicant. Good evening, Mayor and, and Council. Um, my name is Amy Schaefer. I'm here tonight on behalf of the applicant, Circle K. I have with me our development team. So we have our civil engineers, our architects, and also some representatives from Circle K if there are any programmatic questions. Um, I do want to thank planning staff for their presentation. Um, and just briefly, if I could, could go through this. I won't go over the property overview. I think staff's presentation and my prior one, um, I think we're all oriented to where we are on the property and in the city. Again, the current zoning district, so we are requesting CS zoning, uh, which is very near and almost, you know, adjacent to the property that we're requesting, so we do think it's appropriate for the area. Again, the current conditions, the current site is non-compliant with any LDC. Um, requirements of the current zoning districts um, or any future zoning districts, frankly. Um, and as you can see, the landscaping um, is out of date. And so an adaptive reuse of this building just isn't best for the structure. Again, some of the surrounding and current conditions of the building. As you can see, there's not a lot of fenestration on the building, um, small access points. Um, okay, there we go. Um, the neighboring and surrounding properties have been developed. They have not been developed under the UMX code, but they have been developed and upgraded. Um, and so there is revitalization in parts of this area, and our request, we think, would add to that revitalization of the area. Just some different elevations. The site plan if there are any sites plan specific questions. I do want to get to the conceptual landscape plan. Um, if you recall the prior plan and currently there's an outdoor ATM where the um, landscape park area is to the left, it came to our attention that that ATM lease is going to be up before any construction could begin. So if an, a rezoning approval um, is approved tonight, you know, that's only step one of, of a process. So we would have to go through all the storm watering, storm water, TRC, all of the other requirements. And so because that lease would be up, um, we decided to take that space, which did cause some concerns with the traffic flow in that area, people coming in and out um, of the ATM area, and then the access point onto Dawson Street, and created, um, our architects did a fantastic job creating a lovely um, park area. 
And well, yes, it's a private park because it's on private property. Uh, anybody's welcome to, to come and use it in the area, and we hope they do as they come to the store and get a hot dog or a hamburger. And the, I think our architects thought it was important to show you some of the um, inspiration that they used around town for the design of that. As you can see, there are a lot of um, wavy parks and kind of semicircles in the area, and they used these in inspiration for the design feature. A few more illustrations of the space. And I think this is my favorite one. It kind of shows you what we hope to do with that area. And another. And then again, the elevations. Um, we have been through Design Adjustment Committee and Board of Adjustment for any variances or waivers that would be required for the site plan. So the site plan, as you see it, is compliant with the code. Um, there would be an approximate reduction of 10% of the impervious surface on the site. And as we stated last time, the stormwater measures would have to be brought up to current standards. And um, again, we do think that we are um, meeting all of the requirements for a rezoning change. Um, the current property has been vacant for years. Um, as I mentioned, the surrounding, immediately surrounding, there are some properties across the street that have not been updated yet. But the immediately surrounding properties have been updated and designed and look great, but they're not under UMS, UMX code, so it does make it a little difficult to integrate our project with any kind of UMX design standards. The properties within an urban mixed-use center and an inner city revitalization um, this project does create commercial redevelopment near major road intersections and brings a non-conforming building into compliance with code and safety um, through SEPTED design principles. And again, these are just some of the things that, that we've already talked about. The pedestrian areas, the increased security, and the increased and mix of uses um, that would be brought to the area. And then the upgrades that would bring us into compliance with the UDO, the SEPTED principles. And I did want to point out that the general retail use is already allowed in the current zoning and the future. So really, um, the request is for the uh, uh, fuel pumps, which is an accessory use. And with that, I am happy to answer any questions. And as I said, my development team is all here if you have any questions um, about the site plan or um, Circle K's operation. We have a question here, Mayor Pritchett. Yeah. Okay. Hey, Amy. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. You mentioned that the ATM lease yes, is sir. up. Mm -hmm. Now, do I understand that you're going to take the ATM and put it in the store? Yes, sir. The, the ATM <coughs> will still excuse be available. Me. It will be in the store, and the store operation hours are 24 hours. So it will still be available to the residents of the neighborhood 24 hours. Okay. Yes, sir. Good. Thank you. You have questions? Andrews. So I, I wanted to go back to the the staff presentation just really briefly, but you, you might be able to answer it for me as well. Okay. Um, the proposed district is commercial services, and the paragraph here says this district is intended to accommodate intense business uses that frequently require outdoor storage, may involve machinery, and have minimal customer traffic. Uses include building contractors, repair services, wholesaling, and some light industry. The CS district is intended to be located near industrial areas and may serve as a transitional district between industrial and commercial uses. I'm, I'm just not seeing that here as far as minimal customer traffic and y Yes, ma'am, um, and I, I think they're trying to pull up the site plan, but as you can see with the current zoning, there is light industrial to the south of our project and immediately um, east. Ah. <laughs> and, and there's also CS already in there. Also, with the gas station, uh, as mentioned in the TIA, a lot of the traffic is passed through traffic. Um, it's people who are already on the roads for other things. So that's why we thought it would be a compatible use. I don't want to speak for planning. Anybody else? Okay, Ms. Spears. So, Amy, my question is, and... Mayor Pro Tem already tackled my ATM question, <laughs> but 
what's new, what's different yes, this sir. time around compared to the last time? Yes, sir. So we have decreased the impervious surface by removing that ATM and that drive through aisle. We've set the building back a little bit more um, from the street, which increases the pedestrian space along the front. The hope for that is also to address any possible um, conflicts between pedestrians and vehicles because the site, um, the site is a little bit better. You can see better because it's a, it's a wider pedestrian area up there. Um, and then the internal circulation by removing the ATM, that exit aisle onto Dawson, um, there's less conflict and traffic in that area because you don't have people driving in and out of the ATM, which was over there. Well, as far as I know, most people that utilized that ATM walked. Like, they were really residents of the community. And they're, they, I've, I've been out there, and that's true. They do have walkers. I have seen people drive up as well. And our configuration of it, I don't know if you remember from the old site plan, and I'm sorry, I should have had the, the comparison that's on my fine. presentation. It actually did have one of those little, right now, um, the way it's set up, you can just kind of, oh, when I, but they've switched. You can just drive up to it. The way that we had it set up, it was going to be the more typical, um, you know, you drive in, and then there's a little island in the middle, um, and that was right there near that exit lane to Dawson. Right. So, I mean, this, the illustrations are great, but it still doesn't address the, address the fact that there is a gas station across the street. That, that's true. And um, a, at well, the Wait a minute. Wait. A grocery okay. store down the street, multiple gas stations down the street. So... I mean, I'm I'm still asking what's new. I mean, in, in, unless you had a mini pharmacy on the inside of this new Circle K, you know, again, I, I'm still saying the same thing as the last time. You you got to wow me with something, and I'm, I'm not seeing it outside of just getting rid of an abandoned building or vacant building. Um, and, and a nice park. The park is a great idea. <laughs> Thank you. And I do, at the end of my presentation, um, if the question came up, how many gas stations are around, um, there is a um, state map online that keeps track of, of gas stations in the area. And I had pulled that at the end of my presentation just to kind of show where the perimeter and, and where the closest gas stations are. Um, and I know it seems like there are a lot, but but there aren't really. But I get, I get it. And I there are not more changes than, than what you see. But thank you for your feedback, sir. No problem. Yes, sir, Mr. Barnett. Yeah. So um, from the, the record that you pulled up, how many gas stations are in that area? Um, Do you remember I, that? Yeah, I don't. Is it, could you pull up my presentation again? I'm sorry. Um, so what I did was I, I pulled two maps, and I pulled it um, from seven, 16th and 17th up, and then from the river and down. Mm -hmm. And um, now these maps online have not been updated um, since 2002. But we did 2002, I think. Um, but we did double check to make sure with what we could see on Google Maps, and these seem to be these seem to be accurate. Um, so then this is the one from the river, and then there's the one. And I do know that you guys have approved one not showing on here um, so as you're driving um, to and from it's it's not quite as many as it feels like there are now I'm, I'm not seeing anything or are those the dots is that the gas station <laughs> yes sir I apologize okay. the dots are the gas station okay and then the circle is our property on Dawson Street so you can see the gas station immediately across the street like mr. Spears mentioned okay good deal thank you I thank like you. the project thank you sir uh, anybody else We haven't opened up the public hearing, <coughs> Mr. Hall. We haven't opened up the public hearing yet. Hold on. Okay. Okay. At this time, I'm going to open up the public hearing and ask if anybody in the public wishes to speak on this particular item. The, the clerk will be um, keeping time. Each speaker will be allotted three minutes, 30 minute timeline. Just come forward. Who would like to speak and give your name for the record where you live? My name is Alex Hall. I live uh, 1414 Country Club Road. 
Uh, I also have an office at 8th and Market, and it's hardly a day that goes by that I don't pass this site. And I'm just talking as a neighbor. Uh, many times I need to get gas in the morning, and I know that some of you said there are too many convenience stores or gas stations, but it doesn't offer much of a, uh, an opportunity. There's the one, I think it's called Hop and Go or something that's across from Farmer's Supply, and it's a little tiny building that I don't like to go in it. And the next one up is the one across the street, and it's small. It was built when I was a kid, I guess, and it's old. And these, uh, to compare the Circle K with these, con what I have available now, Circle K is just light years ahead of these places. And they're, they're nice to go into. They're clean. Their bathrooms are clean. They've got other things besides gas. They've got an array of groceries and coffee and donuts, which I haven't had one in about 10 months now, thank goodness. But they're, they're good places to go. And uh, as a neighbor, I heard some people say that there's too many stations, but I think I'd like to have this place available to me. And I'm a neighbor, so... That's my input to you for whatever it's worth. I'd appreciate you, you uh, passing this. This would be my go-to place to go in my neighborhood. Thank you. Mrs. Spears, you have a question? Sir? Mr. Hall, quick question. Yes. Now, would you get your groceries from the Circle K compared to the food line? What now? You said the Circle K is going to have groceries. <laughs> so do. are you going to forego going <coughs> to the food line? Yeah, they got groceries at the food line, too. <laughs> or, the, or the Harris Teeter to get your groceries from the Circle K. I, I wouldn't buy my groceries from Circle K. Okay. But i tell you what I would buy. Gas. Before I went on my crash diet, I'd go out of the way to get some of their donuts. And Over their Krispy coffee Kreme? is good. I wouldn't go to the Circle K. I wouldn't go to the food line for my coffee and my donuts and uh, whatever else they have there. But I don't get my groceries there. Okay. Thank you. All right. But it is a nice place. Next. <laughs> Good evening. My name's Jeff Carney. Um, I own the properties to the south at 916 and 918, South 17th. The ones that have actually, uh, we've done quite a bit of work. And I'm excited about uh, proposed changes for the site. Um, I truly believe that the Circle K's presence will uh, improve the competition in the area. Um, we save too many gas stations or, or whatever, but at the end of the day, I drive right past them, past the gas stations, because I think they gouge the community in the area. Um, I've watched building go to the north of that Dawson Street area with the cargo district. I've seen how it's changed the trajectory of everything around it. I see how the residents are investing in their homes. I see how the businesses are growing. I look in the south where I see the apartment complexes out. I pass uh, the apartments and I see people that I never saw before out there walking their dogs. I think that Circle K will do amazing things for the area. I think that it will make people like myself continue to want to invest. And I don't know, there's not that many people that are small companies right now that can afford to invest like Circle K is going to do. I've had a little experience with rezoning. I was on the planning commission where I came from before. And I know it, it, sometimes things don't fit perfectly in that square or that hole, but sometimes it's a need to... To, to make some decisions that will change the community. And I think this is one of them. And I, I really hope that everyone looks at this as a favorable thing and not just another gas station. Thanks for your time. Thank you, sir. Anybody else? Yes, sir. I'm, yes, ma'am. Well, you can come up either which way. Come on. Hi, I'm Suzanne Wortman. I live at 2104 Metz Avenue in the Carolina Place neighborhood. And so I'm in this neighborhood and passing by here. I'm really sad about the Wells Fargo ATM as I 
feel like that's my ATM, particularly since all of the banks close by have closed. Um, and all of the pharmacies have also left the area. There's no pharmacy in the downtown area. The closest one is on Market and Coble. So is this it? That's my question. Is this all we can do? Another gas station? I'm just seeing like we had all these pharmacies that popped up and we let them happen and now they've all left. And so we have all these vacant places where pharmacies were a good idea 15 years ago. And now we've got Sheets and Circle K and all these other um, 7-Eleven. They're going to be gone in 15 years. I'd just like to maybe see if we're thinking about things in a forward fashion um, and really meeting the needs of the neighborhood. Thanks. Thank you. Greetings and salutations. My name is Kahan. I live out east, and I reject this proposal because the last thing we need is another gas station. How about we think about the least of us? What about the plight of the homeless? How about use that structure as a, a homeless shelter of some kind? Clearly, there are several homeless people in that area. <coughs> or unhoused, as is the common term knowledge today. So how about take care of the homeless? What you, do, what you do for the least of these, my brethren, you have done for me. The teachings of our Messiah called Jesus the Christ. The scriptures also tell us that the strong shall bear the infirmities of the weak. We are strong, we are employed, we have homes. Thank God. But the homeless aren't as fortunate, and for whatever reason they're homeless, let us look at that as a way to bring them up from the situation that they're in. Instead of worrying about another gas station, another apartment complex, let's take care of those less fortunate than ourselves. Because if we all claim to be Christians, or we all claim to be believers in God, we read the scriptures and so forth, if we say that we're believers, we say that we're Christian, we say we believe in God, let us do the things that God tells us to do. Let's do the things that Christ tells us to do and help the homeless. I propose that that structure is used as a temporary shelter for the homeless. Because Tent City was dismantled. For whatever reason, I don't know. Now, we have homeless people all over Wilmington walking around aimlessly. Some are taking up uh, space uh, in front of convenience stores, trying to stay out of the heat. Um, if, I'm not mistake, if I'm not mistaken, you can't camp. Let the homeless have somewhere to go. Please use this building as a temporary structure for the homeless. And let's stop catering to those who have. Let's take care of the have-nots instead of the have-mores. Thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. Anybody else? Madam Clerk, have you received any additional comments? Yes, sir, Mr. Mayor. Um, one from Henry Herring, 1919 Norwood Road. His comments are, I'm the owner of Medical Center Properties at 908 and 912 South 16th Street, and I also own the Medical Center Specialty Pharmacy across 16th Street from the property under rezoning review. I support the development of this property by Circle K to provide general retail and fuel services for both the community and traffic coming into the Wilmington area and along the 16th and 17th corridors heading to and from medical facilities. Thank you. Okay. Any additional comments or questions from council? Okay. I'm going to close the public hearing and ask for the wishes of council. We have a motion to approve by Mayor Pro Tem Barnett, second by Councilmember Ravenbark. Um, Mr. Barnett, 
You have to read a consistent statement for the record. Okay. I move to approve the proposed amendment to rezone property located at 1618 Dalston Street from UMX Urban Mixed Use District to CSCD Commercial Service Conditional District for general retail use with associated fuel pumps and find it to be consistent with the relevant policies in the comprehensive plan. Based on the application materials and the information provided at the public hearing and in the staff report and the final approval of the rezoning request is reasonable and in the public interest for the following reasons. The proposed rezoning would allow for redevelopment of a blighted commercial property along a major road corridor and allow for a compatible commercial use. Okay. All right. All in favor of that motion, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? That item passes four to three. Are there any, is there a motion to waive second reading? Second. Motion made by Councilman Waddell, second by Mayor Pro Tem Barnett. Or discussion, all in favor of that motion, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Item passes unanimously on second reading. That brings us to our next item of business, which is item PH2, which is an ordinance amending the official zoning maps of the city to rezone property containing 0 0.46 of an acre located at 219 and 229 South College Road from RBCD Regional Business Conditional District to RB Regional Business. And at this time, I'd like to recognize our city manager, Mr. Cottle. Mr. Cottle. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Zach Smith, our planner one from the department, will overview this item for us. Good evening, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, and members of council. This is public hearing number two, general rezoning of 219 and 229 South College Road. The site is located at the intersection of Oriole Drive and Government Center Drive. The site is part of a larger parcel and under single ownership. The site is approximately 5.49 acres. This request is to rezone 0.46 of an acre of the subject parcel. This portion of the subject parcel is currently used for automobile display and employee parking. This map shows the general vicinity surrounding the request, as well as photos of the subject property. These are photos of the existing conditions surrounding the subject property. These are photos of the adjacent properties and land uses. Commercial uses are located to the north, south, and west of the site. Residential uses are located to the southeast and east of the site. The site is currently zoned RBCD, Regional Business Conditional District. The site is bordered by RB to the north and west, R15 to the east and southeast, and ONI to the south. This portion of the subject parcel was rezoned to a special use district on February 1st, 2000 to allow for automobile display and employee parking. With the adoption of the new land development code in 2021, all existing special use districts were converted to conditional districts. The subject property is located within a suburban commercial retrofit area of opportunity on the comprehensive plans growth strategies map. Suburban commercial retrofit principles encourage the retrofit of underperforming and outdated sites. Staff believes the proposed zoning amendment is consistent with the recommendations of the Create Wilmington Comprehensive Plan and that the request is reasonable in the public's interest. Staff recommends approval. In addition to staff's recommendation, this request was unanimously approved at the June Planning Commission meeting. This concludes staff's presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions you have, and the applicant is here as well. Any questions of staff? Mr. Rambar? The uh, conditional district, what, what did it not allow? Uh, I believe it didn't allow for buildings. It was strictly for parking. Parking for employees and overflow or storage. That's correct. So the, the new RB, the straight RB would, it would just be like, I mean, it's total rezoning, they allow whatever's allowed in RB. That's correct. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. Thank you, sir. This time I'd like to recognize the applicant. Thank you, Mayor, Pro Tem, Council Members. My name is Greg Hartley. I work for Acro Development Services. We're an engineering and surveying firm representing Hendrick Automotive Group. 
Um, we've asked to get this portion of the property rezoned as we are doing plans currently to redevelop the entire parcel. What this does is allows us to kind of expand the building um, into that area. You can kind of see the center here. These two smaller buildings would be removed first while we build a new dealership and then uh, switch the dealership functions over to the new building once it's complete. Um, we started doing planning. We realized this little piece, this half acre, was kind of rezoned uh, with these conditions. We just thought it would be best if we cleaned the entire thing, brought it all up to the regional zoning. Happy to answer any questions. Are there any questions of the applicant? Okay. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. This time I'm going to open up the public hearing and ask if anybody in the public wishes to speak on item PH2. Okay. Madam Clerk, have you received any additional comments? Okay. Are there any further comments or questions from Council? If not, I'm going to close the public hearing and ask for the wishes of Council. And I will also note that whoever um, has made the motion, which seems to be Councilmember Waddell, second by Councilmember Joyner, uh, must read a consistent statement for the record, sir. I move to approve the proposed amendment to rezone property located at 219 and 229 South College Road from RBCD. Regional Business Conditional District to RB Regional Business District and find it be consistent with the relevant policies in the comprehensive plan based on the application materials and the information provided at the public hearing and in the staff report and to find approval of the re rezoning request as reasonable and in the public interest for the following reasons. The proposed rezoning is compatible with the surrounding area and would apply a consistent zoning classification across the site. Okay. All in favor of that motion, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? The item passed unanimously on first reading. Is there a motion to waive second reading? Motion made by C uh, Councilmember Joyner, second by Mayor Pro Tem Barnett. Discussion? All in favor of that motion, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? The item passed unanimously on first as well as second reading. That brings us to our next item of business, which is item PH3. Read PH3 here. PH3 is an ordinance amending the official zoning maps of the city. Rezone property containing 1.16 acres of land located at 1805 Adams Street and 1812 Washington Street from CS Commercial Services to CBCD Community Business with a conditional district for a commercial district mixed use, better known as a CDMU development. At this time, I'd recognize our manager, Mr. Connell. Mr. Connell. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Planner one. Miranda France will overview this item for us. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, and members of the council. The site is located along South Carolina Avenue between Adams Street and Washington Street, contains approximately 1.16 acres and a vacant structure. This map shows the general vicinity surrounding the request, as well as photos of the subject property. And these are photos of the existing condition, conditions surrounding the subject property. These are photos of the adjacent properties and land uses. Commercial uses are located to the north and east. Industrial uses are located to the west and southwest, and single family is located to the southeast. The site is currently zoned CS Commercial Services and is bordered by CS to the north, west, and east in R7 medium density single dwelling district to the south. The applicant proposes to rezone the subject site to CBCD, Community Business Conditional District for a CDMU development. It would consist of 14 two bedroom residential units and 8,500 square feet of ground floor commercial uses. The existing 1,000 square foot structure on site would be renovated to, for support facilities. Additionally, the project includes two lots with driveway access provided from South Carolina Avenue and a cross access connection to the adjacent Dram Tree Tavern located along Washington Street. In front of you are conceptual elevations of the proposed mixed use buildings. The site is located within an employment, academic, and transit-oriented mixed-use center, a post-industrial and inner-city revitalization area of opportunity, and along a main street on the comprehensive plan's growth strategies map. 
The proposed site plan utilizes existing utilities and increases the housing supply while protecting desired neighborhood, neighborhood character through infill development. Additionally, the site plan encourages a continuous pedestrian and vehicular connection between the existing and proposed developments. Staff believes the proposed zoning amendment is consistent with the recommendations of the Create Wilmington Comprehensive Plan and that the request is reasonable and in the public interest. Staff recommends conditional approval with the conditions listed in the case summary be applied. Planning Commission also unanimously uh, recommended approval at their June meeting. And that concludes my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions and the applicant is here as well. Any questions for our staff? Thank, Thank you, Thank you. At this time I'd like to recognize the applicant. Good evening. Thank you. My name is Cindy Wolf. And I'm here on behalf of the owner of the property. Walt Cartier purchased the subject land um, within the whole tract originally that was bound by Washington and Burnett and South Carolina and Adams. And his hope was to renovate the existing building for a restaurant. It took a while dealing with DOT and some future plans they might have had to Kentucky Avenue, but eventually the Dram Tree Tavern opened and it's thriving as a truly neighborhood establishment. The proposed project is on that remaining tract of land that's circled in the yellow. It is zoned for commercial services, which is a fairly intensive use district. He believes that a more appropriate use would be for a less intensive neighborhood commercial type uses, along with some residential space that might provide for more local housing for the workforce in the area. Commercial district mixed use is not an option in that CS district, the pink area. This is the current tavern. Um, although it is not part of the rezoning petition, it will certainly become part of the mixed use that we're trying to create. The plan includes, as uh, Miranda pointed out, a three-story building with uh, 6,000 square foot storefront type units on the ground floor. Occupants might include business offices, small retail, personal services, um, and it, then upstairs there would be residential units. The extra building could be something like a cafe, and again, there are some additional units on that. Oops. Um, when the Planning Commission looked at the exhibits in the case summary, which I'm sure you did, the building's sort of like, wow, what is that exactly? But when you see what the Dram Tree architecture is like, that's the whole intent. So right now, these are conceptual. It's the artist or the architect's first blush on the buildings. But the whole intent is to have the same types of materials, fenestration, and the look of the Dram Tree to just complete the project. So with that, uh, we certainly believe that this proposed CBCD rezoning is consistent and in the public interest. It's certainly an integration and a mixture of uses which are appropriate in all areas of opportunity identified in the Co Create Wilmington plan. Growth can be accommodated in the city through a mixture of uses in neighborhoods where it enhances the desired character of the surrounding area. An infill development where lots are existing and services are available reduces overall development costs and can assist in restoring housing options and diversity. I'd be happy to answer your questions. We have questions, ma'am. Um, Mr. Joyner. Hey, Ms. Wolf, thank you for um, your presentation. Just want to say I think that this is the kind of uh, missing middle housing that we need in Wilmington. I think that the folks at Dram Tree are doing a really good job of place making and place building in that part of town. and. Um, in general, I support this. There were two um, public submissions that were included in the supporting documents, both of which I thought raised really good questions, and I wanted to ask you or whoever may be here to speak to these points. Um, the first one was from David Hugh Holt, who said that he is the rector at the Charismatic Episcopal Church, which is very nearby, mm -hmm. and that's the site that the Healing Place uses for their trudging. So folks who are residing at the Healing Place, which I think many people know is a um, substance use disorder recovery center um, essentially go to a nearby location I, I think his uh, email indicated that his concern is he doesn't want folks to um, move into this area and then start complaining essentially about the services that they're providing so I would ask you to address that and then I'll go ahead and tell you the second piece which is um, from Mr. Spencer Pope who also sent in um, an email about parking, the parking at Dram Tree, the street parking in the area, and how um, parking concerns 
for this for these units would um, I guess work in conjunction with that concern in the neighborhood certainly the the pastor of the church across the street which is across South Carolina Avenue um, came to the community information meeting we were thrilled that we got a very warm reception pretty much from Sunset Park who obviously is very organized when things are happening in their community and like I said I felt like they you know had thought that this was an, a great opportunity for development if it was going to happen that being said you know he was I guess as he pointed out in his email just sort of worried about people moving in and then having a problem with what's across the street but I mean that's sort of a situation where I would hope that anyone looking at housing would investigate the neighborhood that they're going to be moving into before they move into it. I, I don't know that you know we can really address it specifically other than the management office when they're doing their rental agreements. I mean, sort of let the buyer beware type of a thing, but we're certainly aware of it. We don't have a problem with it whatsoever as far as my client and his vision for what this is going to be. Um, and the complaints, you know, if nothing is being done um, contrary to city regulations, uh, it would be fall on deaf ears, I believe. Um, parking. I'm not sure exactly why, but Washington Avenue has no parking along those streets, although Washington Avenue is wide enough for on-street parking, and they tend to park on it anyway. They don't seem to ticket. I'm not positive, and perhaps the city uh, your folks can address this. I don't know that there's any reason not to have parking on that section of Washington Avenue. So it's my understanding that the city council has to oversee that as far as removing the signs, if that's a possibility. So we'd certainly appreciate the more parking. But yeah, what they're talking about back further down on Washington Street is that right now these two lots are used for overflow parking for some of the more active events that are going on at the tavern. Um, part of commercial district mixed use is that combination of parking spaces, not only for the people that live there, but um, sort of sharing them with the commercial uses that are there. Uh, we have adequate parking for all of our commercial use and the residents. Uh, South Carolina Avenue does have on-street parking, as does a little bit of Adams Street. So, again, the ordinance now has a maximum amount of parking, so we can't provide a whole lot more parking than what we're providing now as part of our project. Anybody else? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Moore. This time I'm going to open up the public hearing and ask if anyone in the public wishes to speak on item PH3. Seeing none, Madam Clerk, have you received any additional comments? Okay, are there any further questions, comments from council members? Hearing none, I'm going to close the public hearing and ask for the wishes of council in respect to item PH3. We have a motion to approve by Mayor Pro Tem Barnett, second by Councilmember Joyner. Uh, Mr. Barnett, would you please read a consistent statement for the record as noted? I move to approve the proposed amendment to rezone property located in 1805 Adams Street and 1812 Washington Street from CS Commercial Services to CBCD Community Business Conditional District for a commercial district mixed use development and finally to be consistent with the relevant policies in the comprehensive plan based on the applications, materials, and the information provided at the public hearing and in the staff report, and to find approval of the rezoning request is reasonable and in the public interest for the following reasons. The proposed rezoning provides an appropriate transition between the existing commercial uses and the adjacent neighborhood and provides additional housing options and commercial services for the area. Okay, all in favor of that motion, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Item passes unanimously on first reading. Is there a motion to waive second reading? <coughs> motion made by Councilmember Joyner, second by Councilmember Waddell. Discussion? All in favor of that motion, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Item passes unanimously on first as well as second reading. 
That brings us to our next item of business, which is our resolutions. Uh, item R1 is a resolution authorizing the award of contracts for on-call commercial real estate brokerage services to various firms. And at this time, I'd like to recognize our city manager, Mr. Caudill. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Aubrey Parsley, our economic development director, will overview this item for us. Thank you, Mr. City Manager. Good evening, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, members of council. To start tonight's presentation, I did think it worthwhile to review what staff was hoping to accomplish by bringing this resolution before you tonight to really review the goal and thought process behind it. And really, the goal is fairly straightforward. The city is seeking to sell surplus properties, and we want to be able to do that faster and with market rate offers. Uh, we have seen success. We've had half a dozen items come before you that council has approved for sale over the, the preceding months. But uh, what remains in our inventory of surplus property on the scale of value is larger scale, more expensive, and more complex properties. Uh, and as um, the higher value, uh, as the, the value of the assets grow, and so too does the complexity and the need to bring in dedicated experts. Uh, the pool of buyers for these types of properties are smaller, therefore you need more exposure. Brokers will significantly enhance our marketing ability and the exposure of these properties, not only here in Wilmington, but hopefully across the state and country, and they frankly don't, uh, they, they have marketing budgets that we do not have. Uh, furthermore, the more complexity a property has, the more work it takes to make a sale happen. Uh, a lot more questions to answer from financing to environmental concerns, land use, architectural questions, number of development type questions come into play. So bringing on capacity, third party capacity to aid in the, uh, the surplus sales we think is critical. And then furthermore, the track record that uh, a professional, a real estate professional would have is, is important when you're spending a lot of money to purchase a property. You, you want professional input. You want somebody who has uh, sources and references in the banking industry, engineers, architects, the myriad of professionals that go into making these transactions possible. Uh, certainly, brokers bring a lot of value to the table in, in that fashion as well. So the on-call strategy that we bring before you tonight, we think, staff thinks, fits our scenario well. We have over 10 parcels that are surplus today and they're a relatively diverse set of parcels. Um, the on-call setup allows us to make sure that everyone selected is qualified and a good fit for uh, a multitude of, of the properties we have. Uh, it ensures we have plenty of working capacity available to us, uh, not just pigeonholed into one firm but across multiple firms. And it also keeps pricing down by maintaining significant competition. I'll, I'll go into that here further in a minute. And then administratively, it streamlines the, the process for us. We get the, the vendor set up, certificates of insurance on file, a master contract in place, takes a, a lot of the initial legwork, um, gets it done for us so that we can be more nimble and adapt as, as uh, we move forward. So this is the last side before I, I get into the specifics of the procurement, but I did think it was worth going into since this isn't a, a, a typical ask a council. Um, it's worth touching on how things would work going forward with this setup. So staff, the way we see it, staff would select a property, a group of properties that we wish to activate with a broker. We'd request a proposal from each and every broker on this on-call list. Uh, we'd ask for pricing, marketing strategy, analysis, plans of action, so forth, terms of, of how they would list it and what they'd want to see from us. And then we would take that, uh, we'd take that item to council via a separate action to authorize not only the sale method but the firm or firms that we would look to help have help us um, transact the surplus property and then upon council approval we would issue a task order on top of this master on-call contract to effectively set up a listing agreement with the broker to again help us sell surplus property so under the specifics of this procurement on april 19th of this year we posted an advertisement uh, calling for all commercial real estate firms with uh, relevant experience to submit 
Um, there are qualifications and a, number, a myriad of things here that we'll see in a minute. We, as we always do, called, emailed all the prospective applicants that we thought, folks that were licensed in North Carolina, folks that you know we looked up on Google via our Rolodex through our network of, of, um, of contractors that we have in the city as well. Uh, we did a Q&A, we posted that to the website, submittals were due 30 days later on, on, on May 16th from that original advertisement date. Uh, we formed a, a three-member selection committee and submittals were independently scored in, in, across that three-member selection com committee and then tallied. Uh, looking over the scoring criteria here, uh, there's, there's really two key components of the five that you see here. Um, you can see on the screen most of the weight was on prior success of the firms applying uh, for this advertisement as well as the specific team member experience that the f uh, firms put forward and had on their roster as, as being on their firm um, for the submittal. And then we also score based on the overall quality, professionalism, focus, organization of the submittals we received. Um, we wanted to see a, a good quality understanding of the scope and understanding of the surplus properties the city had as well as a uh, MWBE commitment. We had a great turnout. We had nine submittals and selected four that we bring before you tonight. Uh, the four that we bring before you tonight with the rankings next to them are in bold. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions that council might have. Okay, we have, we have a question here. Uh, council Member Joyner. Just um, thank you for the information. The um, supporting documents describe the selection committee independently scoring you whenever that process. Can you tell me who was on the selection committee? It was myself, Deputy City Manager, Chad McEwen, and Director of Housing and Neighborhood Services, Rachel Lacoe. Okay. Thank you. Uh, um, what did we use before? I'm sorry. I'd what, what did we use before? We use our own internal uh, resources and know-how. Really, it was me, Chad, Deputy City Manager Chad McEwen, uh, looking, thinking of for a specific property who might be a good eligible buyer. Taking the time to reach out to those prospective buyers and doing the the work involved to to make a transaction happen from there and, and that worked again effectively for the, the property surplus properties that we had that were on the smaller scale of, of value range but um, we're, we're not having any success as of late on these bigger higher value um, properties that the city holds in surplus okay and and one of the questions that I had asked um, about minority businesses you know now you said you sent it out you looked at the website Google and all that kind of stuff did were there any minority businesses um, applying in the nine? We did not have any, we had two women owned businesses to my recollection apply. Trademark Properties had a principal and I believe a founder that uh, was, a, was a woman as well as Momentum, um, that, that firm had a, a woman owner and, and founder as well. No minority um, owned businesses uh, submitted, but they did. Uh, m many of these firms did put forward a, um, a, a at least you know by gender um, diverse set of team members. So mm -hmm. I, I will say that is 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 that because there aren't minority businesses out there, or is that because um, we aren't aware of them? Or I'm I'm just I'm curious because you know it's a lot of you know, a lot of resources going out. And I want to make sure that everybody gets a fair shot, you know, shot at it. Y yes, sir. We always strive for that. And every firm that we know of, that we've done business with, heard of secondhand, we tried and, and reached out to. Um, and you know, specifically, I, I cannot think of, of any minority-owned commercial real estate brokers at the moment. Um, and I, I don't know if there are any in town. Okay, I'll make that a homework assignment to find some. Okay, thank you. Mr. Rombard. Mr. Mayor, I, I, I respectfully ask to be recused from this, but I would like to make a comment. This is not the first time the city is engaged in, in this, and it's particularly effective when the city is purchasing. I mean, it's certainly going to be a plus to have 
representation from the outside and selling, but the, the purchasing arms, but where it's not known who the person's representing, that's when it becomes extremely effective. So I would ask to be recused. Uh, so when do we have a motion to recuse Mr. Rambark from this particular item? I'll make the motion then, and then we have a second by Mayor Pro Tem. All in favor of that motion to recuse Mr. Rambark from item R1, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Mr. Rambark, you're now recused. Part of Cape Fear Commercial, Cape Fear that I do work for. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Aubrey? Okay, Mr. Waddell? Yeah, mine's not really a question. Um, I just want to tell the staff that have been working on, on this for, you know, for some time that, uh, uh, I'm happy to see it come forward to me. This is a realization or at least a step towards the realization of the promise that we made to the community in disposing of these uh, surplus properties when we when we acquired uh, uh, the Skyline Center, uh, which was which was a good investment. And I think it's going to expedite getting these properties sold. Uh, it's going to drive economic development and uh, and ultimately get that. Uh, get those properties back into the tax roll, um, have uh, a tremendous economic benefit both to the city government and to, uh, and to the taxpayer. So I'm, I'm excited to see this finally coming forward and appreciate everybody who was involved in it. Okay. Anybody else? All right. What are the wishes, Council, in respect to the resolution? We have a motion approved by, Clifford, by Mayor Pro Tem Barnett, second by Council Member Waddell. Discussion? All in favor of that motion, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Item passes unanimously. Thank you, sir. That brings us to our next item, which is item R2A, which is a resolution to authorize an upset bid process for 115 Market Street, 114 North 2nd Street, 115 North 3rd Street, and 210 Chestnut Street. At this time, I'd like to recognize our city manager, Mr. Carter. Mr. Carter. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. As you might have guessed, Mr. Parsley will review this item as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. City Manager. We'll jump right into this one. It will be a two-man show. Uh, Chance Dunbar, Director of Parking and Downtown Services, will also aid me in this presentation. Um, don't normally put up an agenda for these presentations, but this one, since there's two speakers, I thought that'd be worthwhile. I'll be covering the first four bullets you see here on the slide. We'll go over the property location characteristics, review some of the details of the offer. I'll go into staff's recommendation and add a bit of color to that on this one. I'll do a high level 30,000 square foot, uh, 30,000 foot uh, financial overview, and then Mr. Dunbar will do an in depth review of the parking decks specifically. So these properties as listed on the slide and that were just previously read off are just right across the street from us here in Thalian Hall. We have 115 North 3rd Street, also familiarly known as the United Bank Building and the surface lot attached to it, 210 Chestnut Street. It was a former city administration building, but it is now no longer utilized by the, the city and as we go over here in a moment, has been declared surplus. The other two properties in blue are 114 North 2nd Street, known more commonly as the 2nd Street Deck, and then the Market Street Deck, parking deck, with the address of 115 Market Street. Uh, just some high-level property characteristics. In all, we're looking at 2.42 acres of land downtown, 330,000 square feet of structure building the 115 North third being office space class a office space and then the remainder being structured parking uh, with Market Street including minimal uh, some some offices as well as amenities which Mr. Dunbar will go through here in a minute on the the tax books that um, are, are available to us now the appraisal value amounted to a little over 18 million dollars I did signify, and this is why there's a, a companion item to these resolutions tonight with the blue asterisk here, that two of these properties have not been declared surplus by a council action. So a summary of the offer received, um, the city received an unsolicited offer to initiate an upset bid for those four parcels that were just up on the, uh, that we just reviewed. A uh, $16 million purchase price. That purchase price was not allocated across parcels. It was presented in the aggregate for the group of assets. 
uh, as is required by statute, a 5% deposit, uh, in this case $800,000, was submitted with the offer and the buyer included a term which would allow that deposit to return to them within 60 days, uh, which I believe in, in the offer was worded as any, for any reason or, or no reason. Um, closing would take place within 90 days of contract execution. Uh, properties would be sold in as is condition and would be transferred in this case as presented in the offer via a special warranty deed. Also that we, um, another item that we thought warranted council attention is a term that calls for the leases and license agreements to remain substantially similar at the buyer's discretion to go forward with closing. So here we get to the recommendation and reasoning as was presented in the, the cover letter. Staff does not support the passage of these resolutions. The office building has been declared surplus already and there is virtually no, no use of the office. There's a um, oddball meeting in that space every once in a while, but certainly no regular use by any city staff. Uh, the second street deck, while not presently de declared surplus, is underutilized, uh, especially after the office uh, the city's office consolidation into the Skyline Center. Uh, staff would support surplusing 114 North Second Street, the Second Street deck alone, with the idea being that patrons, um, the folks that use that parking deck, could easily be accommodated in nearby city-owned facilities and capacity would still remain after accommodating the folks who still regularly use Second Street today. But the introduction of Market Street substantially changes the, the proposition and, and staff's view. Uh, Market Street deck, as Mr. Dunbar here will review, financially stabilizes our enterprise fund. The two decks together represent 65% of the parking capacity, city-owned parking capacity in the core of our CBD, which I define as Dock Street to Grace, the River to Third Street. And really, this would be represent, a, in aggregate, a wholesale shift in the, the strategy we have around our parking versus selling what could, could be deemed as uh, excess underutilized inventory. So therefore, staff took the, the null hypothesis on this one and recommended not, pass it, uh, not passing it absent any direct council directive. Um, Going into the high level of financials, this city's historical lifetime investment across these properties amounts to just over $35 million. Uh, this would include capital invested, which would be cash paid or debt service, both principal and capitalized interest. Any capitalized in improvements or repairs made to the facility are also included in this overall $35 million number here. So if you were to look at the offer, $16 million, and compare that with the city's lifetime uh, investment in these properties, which amounts to a little over $35 million, we wanted to uh, make council aware of that investment just to better judge this offer. And we also wanted to, uh, as a result of some of the conversations in, in the budget session, put this last data point on here, which is to say that should council accept this offer and um, we, the city, go to pay down the variable interest rate debt, I think, I believe it's 2023 Series B debt that we have, at the end of January of next year, which is reasonable timing in our view, the total interest savings from that early payment would be approximately $2.7 million. So now going into the specifics of the properties, I'll just quickly review the timeline for uh, 115 North 3rd Street. The city purchased this building for $11 million, $11.1 million in April 2022, and then shortly thereafter, the opportunity for Skyline Center um, became available, and, and council passed a, um, a number of actions which resulted in the, the purchase of the Skyline Center. The property was um, contingently surplus um, as part of that acquisition plan and the sale of Skyline Center closed in July 2023 which removed the contingency of the surplus and made 115 North 3rd Street and, and the surface lot next to it 210 Chestnut Street uh, officially surplus. Uh, staff was quick to jump to action on that one. It was a very high priority for us to try and sell. We went uh, forward and council approved a disposition method of a sealed bid sale 
on this one that was um, fresh off the success of 1110 Castle Street sealed bid sale. However, this sealed bid um, advertisement did not yield us any bids. And so thereafter, staff engaged in efforts to initiate upset bids and attract new tenants in the building, just looking to further uh, allure potential buyers to, to this property and get it, get it sold um, and it's back on the tax rolls for us. So with that, let me um, welcome Mr. Dunbar up here to speak specifically to uh, the two parking decks considered in the resolution. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, thank you, Mr. Parsley. I just fast forwarded here a little bit, sorry. So some details on the parking portion of, um, of this item. Second Street parking deck, originally constructed in 1991. Total 391 total parking spaces. Um, as a point of interest, it does contain a pretty decent sized storage area for the city's uh, public services team, the recycling and trash storage. Um, Recycling and trash services storage. There are two John Deere Gator vehicles in there as well as supplies that assist uh, their team in some cleaning of, of downtown and trash collection through the blue bag service. Um, most of the usage at this facility historically has come from the city offices formerly located at 305 Chestnut. Uh, the building at 115 North 3rd Street currently owned by the city. 101 North 3rd Street kind of next door to our building and then various other uses in the area. Second Street Deck leading into 2020, um, pre-COVID, it, it had very good usage, very high occupancy. Uh, our, our peak occupancy at that deck, uh, even now, is daytime, somewhere between the 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. time frame. Pre-COVID, we were hitting that 85 plus percent number regularly. Uh, at times 100% with the full sign out there. Um, post COVID, we dropped slightly with some office demand changes, the work from home, just the, the overall dynamics um, that shifted post COVID. And then with the city's strategic locate, relocation to 929 North Front Street, uh, our peak numbers by day right now are roughly 52% uh, Monday through Friday, somewhere between that 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. number. 1 p.m. time frame. Uh, the evening and weekend peak, that 37%, it's been pretty static since I've been in this position. It, it, it drops significantly at night and on the weekends, um, but that 37% number is, is, is pretty common in that deck on, on average uh, Monday through, th Sunday through Thursday after 5 p.m. and uh, peak weekend time, somewhere between the daytime and evening time there. But as you can see, there's significant open spaces at this parking facility right now. Uh, financial outlook, uh, not great, but also not, not horrible. Right now, we're putting about $160,000 in the bank after all of our expenses are paid. Um, an item that should be noted that did not go into the $35.2 million investment that Mr. Parsley noted is the city also just put $2.3 million worth of capital repair uh, into this facility that probably gave it an additional 15 plus years of life, um, which, which definitely adds value, not only for the city, but also any kind of potential future sale of this asset. We've got about 750,000 of approved and planned capital uh, at this facility currently. Um, we're looking to upgrade the elevators as well as do our next phase of, of structural repair from items that have come up since our previous repairs two years ago, as well as items that were just not, not emergency type items in our, in our recent project. Uh, it should also be noted what plays into our financial outlook here is the relocation of the city employees. Uh, that revenue that was being paid from the general fund into the parking fund of 90,000 per year uh, is no longer coming into this location. It's been relocated up to uh, 929 North Front Street where our employees, majority of our employees are parking currently. And these figures also factor in a 5% general growth on area parking activity. Now to Market Street. I um, like to consider Market Street our, our shining star, crown jewel of our off street parking program here. Uh, originally constructed in 2003, has 570 total parking spaces. 
Uh, there's office space on the ground level for the Park Wilmington contractor. It's kind of our front facing uh, retail side of our operations. Uh, they also house uh, 29 employees, uh, 29 plus employees out of that area. Uh, WPD Downtown Task Force also has a strategically located uh, space of operation there, uh, as well as two public bathrooms on the west side, first level of this parking facility. It's a total of 520 contracted monthly parkers at the facility. Roughly 20% of those 520 utilize our $25 highly discounted rooftop rate. Um, and I, I think it's important to note most of the usage coming to and serviced by this asset is, is really driven by the small businesses in our vibrant downtown. Not only the owners uh, of these properties and businesses, but their workers, the visitors, um, as well as all the hospitality workers that are downtown. Uh, a good data point, we just processed over 300,000 parking transactions at this facility last fiscal year. So that's 300,000 opportunities for these small businesses downtown to you know, capitalize off of that. As Mr. Parshley alluded to earlier, um, if we were to surplus the Second Street parking facility and it either not remain public parking, get demoed, what have you, we do have the ability based on the current occupancy and needs at the Second Street parking deck to service those needs at neighboring facilities, including River Place, the Market Street deck, and the Ligon Flynn parking lot. So if that asset ceased to be public parking at any given time, we can absorb essentially every single one of those parkers down the street at the Market Street deck. That's really how important that deck is as well. Um, we ran a 10-year performa, um, and Expenses paid, we're projecting up to $7 million of net income uh, at this facility, generated by this facility over the next 10 years. Um, and I will, would like to make a point. Uh, I made a presentation to council back in March on our benchmark parking rates and a comparison to benchmark cities around the state in Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia. Um, our parking fees are currently 40 to 50 percent lower than our benchmark average. So this seven million dollars uh, is, is projected on our current parking fees with nominal increases in 2029 out of that 10-year projection. But there is latent value in this seven million dollar figure if we were to get more aggressive with our parking fees and raise them closer to our benchmark cities. So I think seven million dollars could potentially be on the low end of what we could generate in terms of income at this parking facility. Um, this $7 million projection also factors into future parking fees across system wide with the enterprise fund. Uh, this extra income will help continue to cover any operational losses at River Place as well as skyline deficits where the margins aren't nearly as good as they are at market or are going to be as good at market here in a few years. Um, we're projecting uh, 300,000 roughly uh, in NOI over the next three plus years. And in 2028, FY28, that's when our debt service ends. So as soon as that debt service payment ends and that asset is 100% paid, uh, we're projecting close to a million dollars a year in income uh, going back into the parking. Here is uh, just an aerial geographic view um, of the public parking between roughly, as, as Mr. Parsley said, Dock Street to Gray Street, Water to Third Street, um, Market Street deck and the Second Street parking decks strategically located right there in the central core of our CBD. Uh, very important, especially Market Street. Uh, without those, uh, the Enterprise Fund essentially uses 60 plus percent of our parking uh, assets right there in the core of our vibrant downtown. And in closing, I would just like to cycle back to one of the slides Mr. Parsley went over. Um, cities invested through staff strategic planning and 
Council's strategic support through the last 20 plus years, $35.2 million in these three assets. The under unsolicited offer on the table tonight is for $16 million, which is less than 50% of what the city has invested into these assets. Um, so with that, just wanted to focus on that and uh, happy to open up for any questions on the parking side. Hopefully Mr. Parsley is still behind me uh, to help, but happy to answer any questions. Are there any questions? Chance? Yes. Yeah, you mentioned that um, what we pay for parking is not equivalent to what others in the area are paying? And are we like really far behind or just? So every year we, um, we go through just an automatic practice and we do a rate survey for about 12 to 16 benchmark cities in the region, mm -hmm. Georgia. Uh, it's Savannah, Charleston, Columbia, uh, Richmond, Asheville, Durham, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, our off-street parking fees currently uh, compared to those at market and second to those benchmarks are somewhere between 40 to 50 percent lower than that average. I think the monthly per month rate is 40 plus dollars less on average and that daily max rate is a considerable amount less. I think that at daily max average was somewhere around the 23 to 24 dollars. And we're about to go up to 14 daily max. So hmm. definitely is some, some, some latent value there and, and, and some big percentage point difference there in comparison. Okay. Good. Mr. Waddell. This is probably related to R2B, <coughs> um, but staff's recommendation then would be to surplus 114 North 2nd Street and not surplus 115 Market Street. Correct? Correct. Mr. Spears. Chance, I uh, don't want to second guess what you're saying here. I would hate for the uh, parking attendance of Wilmington, for a safer Wilmington to attack me on social media. But when I do travel to other places and the parking is so high, it's, it's, it's more of a burden to park when you're traveling than it is Wilmington in Wilmington and I guess because it's my home I, I can I can park, I can walk, I can I know the ins and outs. So I mean I do believe that that is slightly the draw to our downtown where you can come and park comfortably and, and don't have to worry about being out of town, getting a ticket getting booted or waking up in the morning and your car's gone, it's been towed or something like that, and maybe that does happen and I just don't know about it. But I, I think that's the draw to here in the difference of these other areas, you know, like, like I said, going to Raleigh and Durham and going downtown and it's such a cumbersome act to find parking or when you park in a place and you got to use the app and it's, Thirty dollars to park in the parking lot for twelve hours, and then if it's six o'clock, you got to get up six o'clock in the morning and move, or you you got to add more money because you don't know what's going to happen. So I think that's I understand what you're saying about the additional rev revenue, the seven million dollars in the ten years. If we become, you use the term aggressive. I I would hope we don't become too aggressive. But I understand that there's some flexibility in there, but I also think that's the draw. You can you can park here comfortably and you know, you might get a ticket, but it's it's not something that's gonna really really hurt you that bad. So I I I think that's the feel that we have here that's that's better than these other places. Yeah, I'll agree with you, Mr. Spears. I think Wilmington's one of the easiest cities to park in up and down the East Coast. So cool. having lived in other other municipalities, I will agree with I, I'm glad you agreed. I don't need any more employees <laughs> mad at me. Ch Chair, oh, well, I guess Aubrey and Chance, both of you. Um, on the on the um, Second Street deck, it was at 85% occupancy when the city was here with 305 and at the Harrelson Center. 
So we're both, we, those, both those properties are surplus properties for sale. What analysis have you done in respect to how does that parking tie in with the sale of those two properties? Because if you don't have parking to offer for the sale, let's just say you sell it to one entity that takes down one of the buildings and takes the parking with it, and then you go to sell 305, do you have enough ample parking available to make that 305 an attractive sale? Because they're critically important. You know, the parking program that was started many years ago by council was to support businesses and development downtown. And of course, that's the reason you have the vibrancy. If you can't park, as Kevin alluded to, you're not gonna come. So those parking structures, I appreciate the, 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 the advice on the Market Street deck, and I agree with your sentiment, but the one here at second, even though it's underutilized currently because of the office use, leaving going north, these properties are gonna be reused or sold at some point in time. So how does that play into the equation if you sell it to one entity with one building, but you don't want the other? From a redevelopment point of view. I, I think that's something we would potentially need to take a deeper dive in if, if we were to surplus the Second Street parking deck. Um, I think through the years, the Second Street parking deck had service 305 Chestnut. Um, one of the biggest constraints of that is Third Street. I think Third Street's a, a definite barrier to potentially servicing any future development further there across the street. And I think depending on what eventually goes and gets built at 305 Chestnut, that current property, potentially has to be some parking on site, depending on what uses end up being. Well, I, I think we need to do a deeper dive because you also have the redevelopment of the library. And I don't know how many spaces on the private sector side, whether it be a motel whether, or a hotel or whether it be a you know, townhouse or condos or whatever, how much of that deck, that 600 some spaces that the county owns are gonna be taken by the private sector and how much is left for this just general area. I don't have a problem in surplusing. I just wanna make certain that we're not doing something that would harm the, the actual sale of one or the other properties. I can, I can see why somebody would want it. I would want it if I was trying to buy it, especially when the building's here. But the 305, especially on this side of the street, is more of a concern because I would imagine that whoever buys that property, unless they can utilize, re, redo the building there, I think will probably, it'll come down to redevelop it in some, in a better way, so. Yeah, obviously we, got to, we need to take a deeper dive on, on, on the second street deck. I think there's potential more value and potential more activity and potential, um, potentially more revenue if the city continue, doesn't surplus it, continues to own it to, to capture some of that overflow parking. Yeah coming from the county project and potentially parking needs for, for the future of that 305 Chestnut project. And, I don't, and, and you know, I know that, that that deck there was built primarily for the court system, but since that is gonna be shared with the court system, the library and new development that takes place, unless the new development is gonna incorporate some parking, which I don't believe they will, but I might be wrong in saying that, but I think there needs to be some discussion with that developer to determine what they're thinking about there, at least to have some idea. They may not have any concrete ideas currently, but in the future, how that plays into this whole redevelopment of this area, I think is critically important. And, you know, one of the reasons, you know, the, the 929 North was attractive to us because we had an 1100 car deck there that we didn't have to build another deck that tied into what we were trying to do down on that end also. So. This parking issue is very critical to how we dispose of these properties and how we utilize them. And I hope we do a real deep dive in it because I hate to be making a decision that a rational, because I don't think we're in a, I don't, I think we're in, in, I know we love to sell these properties as quickly as possible, but I also don't believe that we're in a position where we have to do a fire sale either. And I just want to make sure that we're making the right decision for the citizens of the community and for the redevelopment purposes and also being able to sell the property if necessary to make the deals work. That's just my comments. Okay. Any other questions? Mr. Mayor, yeah. yes. Mr. Mayor, the um, agent for the proposed buyer 
is in the audience if you'd like to speak with him. Sproul Thompson is a local real estate agent who represents the proposer for this acquisition if you have questions or if he'd like to address the group. Sproul, I don't know if you, I mean, if you'd like to address a group, you're more than welcome to. Appreciate the offer and give us some wisdom here as to about your offer. Mayor, council members, thank you for your time this evening. Y'all have had quite an evening. <laughs> a lot going on today. Appreciate it. Um, there are just a couple points I would like to make, and you made some of them for me already with regard to the necessity for the parking to go with that deck, yeah. I mean, for the uh, parking to go with that building. The other thing is, uh, the folks that I'm dealing with, folks I represent, um, part of the partnership is made up of folks that are in the parking business. They are not looking for these decks to tear them down and redevelop. They're looking to maintain them as parking decks. They plan to implement programs that will be for the benefit of the folks that live and work downtown and the folks that live in the rest of Wilmington. They're going to restructure a whole program to make it cost efficient for people to come downtown with the benefit to them being the transients and raising the prices in the transient areas. So they are trying to look after the locals in that regard. But um, a couple points I wanted to make with the numbers. Um, I don't fundamentally disagree with the numbers except for a couple points. The, um, the data about $10 million for the Market Street deck over the next uh, several years, I don't see how we're going to get there because the numbers we saw showed a $300,000 a year loss on that deck right now. So I'm not sure how we can make that leap. The other thing that I would like for you to take a, a close look at is the money that, you, that the city has put into an asset over the life, the acquisition costs, interest carry, and capital improvements, that does not relate to the market value of a property. Now, it's my understanding that, uh, that Mr. Caudill has suggested having these assets appraised, and that makes perfect sense. We certainly would, would yield to that and like to come back and see you at a later date. We would also like to request that the earnest money that we have on deposit be returned so that we can start gaining interest on that money. It's, um, we feel like that's a legitimate request. And with that, I thank you for your time, and we look forward to seeing you once these appraisals come back in. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Thank you. Appreciate it. It's a fair assessment. Yes, sir, Mr. Waddell. Yes, uh, my question is for Mr. Connell. <clears throat> if we, you know, if we deny, you know, if we deny R2A, how fast did the uh, potential buyers get their earnest money back? I would assume it's in short order. It should be by the end of the week. I mean, we, we are just holding the check. It should just be nothing more than getting that check and returning it to them. Okay, thank you. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. Mr. Mayor, I'd like to uh, make a motion to recuse myself from this um, item. Okay. We have a motion to recuse Mr. Ravenbark from item R2A. Okay, we have a second to that from... Uh, Councilmember Waddell, all in favor of that motion, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? I am passing unanimously. You are now recused, Mr. Rambark. Okay. So, Mr. Mr. Cottle, what are you asking for? Or what direction do, are you asking from this council at this point in time? Our uh, suggestion, uh, recommendation would be for you to reject the offer, and we will uh, work. Where, as you know, we are uh, endeavoring to get a appraisal on the second parking deck now. We certainly could then share ballpark numbers with the potential um, um, acquisition agents uh, and see if they want to come up on the number. But right now, we just don't believe that the value being offered is equal to the assets. Do you know um, how long that appraisal will take? That should do? be in within the next 30 to 45 days. Okay. And then in respect to the redevelopment opportunities that we have down here, uh, how are you going to look at, how is that going to be assessed? Are you going to do it internally or are you going to go outside to do that? I think we could we can look at it internally. I think we'd have more confidence in the numbers if we went outside. You will recall that we've done parking studies in the downtown area before. I can't remember the date of the last one. I'm sure Chance can tell us right off the top of his head. But I do believe we could do an internal analysis. And But I do believe that it would also be more beneficial to have someone come in and do a professional outside analysis. Okay. I would recommend that. 
I think I think that we're dealing with some pretty um, important assets for this community, and I think that we should at least before we make that decision, make sure that we have all of the facts and knowledge necessary to make a good decision, sound decision, whatever that decision is going to be in respect to how do we dispose of the properties and also make sure that we're getting the highest value for those assets as we sell them. Okay. Well, as you noted, when we left, we, we took a, a big chunk out of that parking. If someone wanted to utilize that same deck for 305 or whatever the repurp whatever for whatever purpose it was repurposed, uh, we'd certainly need to know that and certainly be able to let them know what we could accommodate because that, in, in my estimation, that property has great potential. Uh, it's just a matter of how much parking it's going to need. Well, let me ask you, that I know that we made it, we took action on, on um, using some real estate firms to market some of these properties. Will any of those firms be involved in any of the discussion here in respect to advice they could give us? We have one firm that is uh, national and international in their scope. We certainly can approach them and ask them to do, um, <clears throat> excuse me, they have, they have referenced or they have uh, worked on selling these types of assets before. We certainly could talk to them and see what they might be able to do for us. And then you have a better understanding also of the um, property here, the library that's being redeveloped with, with, with the new library a center there, and and I guess you you have communication with Mr. Kudre, uh, I'm sure, quite often. And you know, can we ask that question of of them? Certainly, we can ask that of them, and I'm sure they'll have it with the developer. It's going to be based on the number of units and how many um, spaces sure. they need for each of those. But then you also got to remember you're bringing the museum back downtown, and so you're going to have an additional parking load, so to speak, on that deck. I will say that my my general um, knowledge about the utilization of the county deck is it's it's pretty much underutilized at this point in time, but we certainly could work on that in the process. Okay, very good. Uh, Mr. Waddell? Yes. Kind of jump back and forth between R2A and R2B. I, I'm still, I believe the staff recommendation for R2B, if I'm getting ahead of myself, I apologize and I can wait, but uh, was to surplus 114 North 2nd Street, which makes a lot of sense to me. It, it, it seems to add value to the United Bank building next door. And if you know someone was to come forward with a uh, with a bid to purchase that, there's nothing saying that we'd have to do it. And in the interim, we're getting a we're getting an appraisal and and, and gathering all that information that you have. But it gives the uh, real estate firm, international real estate firm, time to put marketing together and actually get it on the market. I, I, I would be a proponent of uh, taking the staff's recommendation and putting 114 North 2nd Street and into our additional surplus properties. But I, I just don't see the downside. I don't have a problem in doing that. I, I, I'd just like to have a, a, a little bit more information and knowledge in respect to how that 2nd Street deck ties in with 305. I understand the United Bank building, that makes sense, Luke, but the 305, because you're crossing the street and you're surrounded by a neighborhood, I mean, basically, you got partial neighborhood and office and institutional behind you. The parking lot here is primarily owned by the county, except for a couple of spaces that we use, but that 305 piece is, is the more tricky piece in regards to how we provide parking or some semblance of parking unless they put the parking deck underneath and then how high can you go in that particular area? I think you can go maybe 110 feet. I might be wrong, but I just, from my perspective, I just, I would feel more, I would feel better if I could have a little bit more information in respect to how that second street deck, it might, it might prove that it's, it's not necessary at all, but I would like to at least have that knowledge. Sur surplusing the property certainly does not necessarily mean it is going to be for sale. Okay. You certainly could go ahead and surplus the property uh, and we could go ahead and do the due diligence that the mayor suggested regarding the parking study and then come back with you to you with a recommendation. More importantly, it would also give you more knowledge on which you could base any potential offer that would come through the door. Okay. That sounds right. Yeah. All right. Okay. So we would need a motion to, to deny, deny R2A this, first, right? To, to deny R2A. 
Okay, so we have a motion to to deny to deny by Councilmember Spears, second by Councilmember Andrews. Any further discussion? All in favor of that motion, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. So, okay, so that's a unanimous vote. Now we go to the R2B, which is the resolution declaring the city-owned property located at 114 North 2nd Street and 115 Market Street as surplus property and available for sale. And we would suggest that you drop 115 Market Street from surplus. Agree. Okay. So. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, Mr. Robinburg. Uh, Mr. Attorney, do I need to recuse myself from this one as well? I mean, did the first recusal cover this? Um, I, I don't think you need to recuse yourself from this one. Okay. But there's no sale contemplated in this one. I think it's fine. Okay. So, um, Mr. Waddell? So would this just be an amended resolution or just simply make a resolution to declare city-owned property located at 114 North 2nd Street as surplus? And available yes, sir. For sale? That, that would be correct. So moved. Okay, we have a, okay, Luke, can you go ahead and make the motion? Yes, we have a motion to approve by Councilmember Waddell, second by Mayor Pro Tem Barnett, to uh, resolution declaring city-owned property located at 114 North 2nd Street as surplus and available for sale. All in favor of that motion, please indicate by saying aye. aye. Any opposed? The item passes unanimously. That brings us to item R3, which is a resolution expressing support for North Carolina House Bill 864, an act to protect the citizens of North Carolina from drinking water contaminated by Gen X and other PFAS compounds. This was a bill that was supported, or was brought forward by um, our state representatives Davis and Eiler in respect to being able to go after the polluters that um, have contaminated the Cape Fear River with Gen X, Camores especially. Um, it is now over at, in the Senate, which they are now contemplating that. I know. Um, I have heard that the state chamber has taken an opposite view of this particular bill for whatever known reason, but um, I feel very strongly that we need to support our House representatives and make sure that our Senate delegation understands how important this is to this community and for the damages that this company has um, incurred upon the citizens of not only Wilmington, New Hanover County, but everybody up and down the Cape Fear River from Fayetteville down to the mouth. And I think it's very important that we send a strong message back that we agree with their support of House Bill 864. So I'll make the motion that we uh, ask for this. Mr. Waddell? Yeah, um, Mr. Mayor, I do just, I feel compelled to correct the record just a bit. We said that the bill is passed the House and is in the Senate. However, I, I pulled it today and House Bill 864 has not yet been heard in the House. So the Senate can act on a, on a House bill that's not yet moved. But nonetheless, I, and I support the resolution. I, I think that these companies need to pay for cleanup costs rather than our ratepayers of our community. I certainly see a PUA. Um, but I think it's important to correct that record that it's not yet in the Senate, uh, has not yet been heard in the House. And also to just take a minute to publicly recognize some of the important work that's been done by Senator Michael Lee and, and uh, the majority of our state delegation. I'm gonna, if you would uh, allow me. Um, Part of the ongoing efforts to address the impacts of PFAS contamination in our region, significant funds have been allocated by the General Assembly. $35 million to the CFPUA uh, used as follows, $18 million for uh, drinking water extension to underserved communities, unserved communities, sorry, in New Hanover County that are impacted by PFAS, and $17 million for municipal consolidation and regionalization of water and sewer systems in New Hanover County impacted by PFAS. Additional $30 million uh, to the Lower Cape Fear Water and Sewer Authority. Additional $45 million to New Hanover County with $15 million of that allocated to, dedicated to uh, water and wastewater projects related to Blue Clay Business Park, which as we all know is gonna be a major economic driver and the city should certainly see some benefit from that. So last year alone, our community saw $110 million invested uh, in, in water and sewer projects and, and that doesn't even include some additional funding uh, provided through the, the Water Safety Acts, which has appropriated $50 million of direct funding from the General Assembly and leveraged hundreds of millions in research. So while I certainly support that resolution, I thought it, it was only right to uh, just reference and, and, and thank our state delegation for the tremendous amount of work that they've uh, put forward into uh, putting us at the tip of the spear uh, and being nationally recognized uh, for, for our efforts. Appreciate that, thank you. Um, I'm going to go ahead and make that motion to approve. We have a second to that. We have a second by Councilmember Spears. All in favor of that motion, please indicate by saying aye. 
Any right. opposed? That item passes unanimously. That brings us to our next item, which is our last item of business, which is item R4, which is a resolution to allow the New Hanover County Sheriff's Office to enforce and remove abandoned vessels in the city of Wilmington waterways. This time I'd like to recognize our city manager, Mr. Cottle. Mr. Cottle. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. The New Hanover County Commissioners recently passed an ordinance designed to create or to eliminate, excuse me, confusion with regard to maintenance of abandoned uh, boats in waterways in and around the county. Um, they have offered us the opportunity to pass a resolution which would authorize the Sheriff's Department to take similar action with regard to boats in the waterways of the city of Wilmington. Most specifically, it's designed for them to not only identify, but when needed, remove those boats from the waterway. I'm not sure that this has a great deal of impact with regard to the city because many of our uh, jurisdictional boundaries run to the high water mark as opposed to the middle of the waterway. But where it does apply, I would say that it would, for the sake of confusion and clarity, uh, sake of saving confusion for clarity, I think it would be worthwhile just to go ahead and pass the resolution authorizing the sheriff to enforce the, um, the ordinance within the city of Wilmington. Tony, just out of curiosity, and I agree with this, um, during a hurricane when the water comes up and the boat breaks loose or what have you, it ends up in somebody's yard, and, and it's out of the high water mark. Who has to take, who has to remove that boat, just out of curiosity? I'm sure you've dealt with it when you were the manager down there at Rice Beach many years ago. I want, to, I want to see what the attorney has to what, say what, about what, this. How, do, how, does that, how does that get resolved? The shrimp boat pulls up and ends up in your backyard. Uh, who's responsible for that, just out of curiosity? Because you got a lot of creeks and waterways and intercoastal waterways. Admiralty law was not my specialty in law school, but I, I think the responsibility um, lies initially with the owner of the boat. But the, the property owner is going to have rights to, especially if there's some kind of contact with the structure, then it gets more complicated. So it's 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 a mess when that happens. Because some of these boats, they just get abandoned. Sailboats, I've seen them there for years, and they just sit there in the waterway, especially on the others on the on the federal side, I guess, on those barrier islands, and they just sit there for years. And I guess. So the owner just walks away from the, it. The, the, the real problem when it's, is when it floats up on an island that is not claimed by anybody. <laughs> so that's when like, you have a real problem. Like, like Palm Island. Yes, sir. <laughs> okay. Very good. Okay. Very good. <clears throat> yeah. What are the wishes of council respect to the to the resolution? We have a motion to approve by Mayor Pro Tem Barnett, second by Council Member. Andrew's discussion on the favor of that motion, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Item passes unanimously. This concludes the regular agenda. Sean, anything to be brought forward? Uh, no, sir. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Mayor, you have a motion for closed session this evening. Uh, the staff has taken the liberty of adding one item to that for your uh, information, but we'll need a motion to go into closed session. Very good. Very good. Madam Clerk? You okay? Mr. Joyner? No, thank you. Mr. Waddell? Just real quick. Um, last week, I met with a, a group of rank-and-file members of the Wilmington Fire Department and the Wilmington De Police, Police Department at, at their request. They requested to meet to discuss some, some grievances that they had, and we had a, a long uh, but professional and productive meeting. And what I took away from it is they have some, some legitimate concerns uh, that, that, that should be listened to. Top-line issues were the transparent, transparent pay and promotional structure. Uh, I went through the structure with them that they have to navigate and frankly was, was very confused. Uh, of course, as a layman, that's maybe not surprising. Um, but it seemed to me like that was not probably the proper way to promote upward mobility in an organization uh, and, and, and retain uh, top talent. Another issue was benefit structures that are uh, at least perceived as not commensurate with surrounding jurisdictions. Uh, don't take into account time of service, uh, some forced and mandatory overtime issues without commensurate compensation, uh, holiday pay um, issues, uh, among some others. Lastly, is also my understanding that for the Wilmington Police Department, when you're seeking a promotion, you're required to go before a promotional board. Um, that board is uh, made up of three community leaders and two police professionals. So. Um, putting the you know the futures of our men and women uh, in the police department into the hands of individuals who really don't have any idea how how that job is done. I believe that's that that process has been around since 2020. Um, 
that's something I, I, I took some significant issue with. Uh, so, I, basically, what I what I'd like to propose uh, to the mayor, and we don't have to you know discuss this tonight, but I'd like to convene a, a committee of council members to review these issues in in, a, in short order, which I'm happy to serve on um, directly with the head of our HR and Tony or whoever is best in the in the city manager's office. I think it's important to to have these discussions. I think. It, with retention specifically, uh, we're, we're, we're losing people in, in both organizations. I think it's rare that you find both organizations coming together and, and, and discussing grievances, but um, it was important to me and, and I intend to you know continue to bring it forward in whatever is the most appropriate manner. Again, uh, I don't intend for us to hash that out tonight, but uh, would like to discuss the best way forward. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Barnett. Yeah. Um, I was glad that the attempt uh, to assassinate former President um, Trump failed, okay? But I also, um, I think, brings us to, a, to the attention of just how tense we are as a nation and all that's going on. So um, there's a thing I did with my kids Sunday in, in the little children's church piece where I talked about, you know, God gives us two ears, one mouth, you know, and, and two eyes. And I think that that reminds us that we ought to be, and the scripture says, quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. I think that we need to spend more time listening, more time watching, and, and more time being slow to anger. And so that can help by just speaking to people and, and being kind to folks and opening the doors uh, because uh, we, don't, we don't solve things through violence. Okay, and I just, just want to remind us to be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Thank you. Yes, today is my grandson Grayson's 18th birthday. He's a man now, and I uh, wanted to wish him a happy birthday. And secondly, I had asked sometime, gosh, I guess it's been over a month, about a joint meeting of the Planning Commission and City Council. Hadn't heard anything back. Just wanted to make sure that but didn't get. Yes, sir. We're in the process of trying to coordinate schedules. That is very difficult. Okay, you, I, I haven't been contacted. Sanders. Yes, today I had the opportunity to go out to uh, the Cape Fear Habitat for Humanity, their kickoff of their habitors. They're now going to be giving tours to anybody that's interested of their facility that's out across the river. Um, they have a warehouse where they not only build the walls and components of the homes and then erect the walls on site, but they also have a training center there where they um, teach their homeowners uh, skills on how to maintain and repair their homes. And it was, a, it, it was a great experience, and they are looking for volunteers, donors, um, and, um, and also people that are interested in becoming homeowners. And and find out more at capefearhabitat.org. Ms. Spears. Yes, sir. Let me start off by saying happy belated birthday to Mayor Pro Tem. July the 8th, I believe, right? Turned 70, 70 years young. Happy birthday, sir. I, I would also like to, to thank Councilman Waddell for providing some clarity as to what happened earlier in this city council meeting. So instead of being attacked on social media, he was requested to sit down with members of uh, city staff so that they could express their grievances. Not attacked in the post. His family was not attacked in the post. But why, sir? You, you talk, and, and, and then I'll, I'll go on to the, uh, the other part where their, their, their grievances about who serves on a committee um, The Wilmington Fire Police, the, the Wilmington Fire Department, the Wilmington Police Department, they serve the citizens. So the citizens have a, should have a fair opportunity to select or give their input on who helps to serve the community. There, there doesn't need to be anything that's divisive about that. Nothing at all. There, there doesn't need to be anything that's divisive about the way I sit in this seat and advocate for every single person in this community, every single person 
that works for this organization. But you, you played your hand earlier because you wanted to call a, a point of order because you, you knew what it was about. And then you came right back around and further exposed what's going on. And if they were to, and, and I believe if anyone reaches out to you as it relates to the Wilmington Police Department, because they see you publicly criticize the Wilmington Police Department and criticize the chief openly. That's all I have, Mr. Mayor. Tomorrow um, at 10.30 at Dream Tree Park, there is going to be a, um, a ceremony. Um, the governor will be here. Um, I know that uh, the, the head uh, of the Department of Transportation for the state will be here. I believe also the head of the F um, Federal Highway Administration is also going to be here um, to share, of course, which a lot of people are already aware of, the $242 million that the federal government is earmarking toward the replacement of the Memorial Bridge, which is a big, big deal. Uh, it's something that we've been talking about for quite some time. This is the first phase of a very important um, piece of the, pi uh, of the puzzle here. Obviously, the rest of the money, what this bridge is going to look like, how much it's going to cost, that's still to be determined. Um, and so I just want to say from my perspective is I want to thank our federal delegation in Washington for those of us that have been there several different occasions, especially Senator Tillis' office and uh, Congressman Rouse's office, who have been very, very helpful in pushing um, the administration and the Secretary of Transportation to get this money to us. And I, I just want to say thank you. I just want to say thank you to, the, to our state delegation. I know that they're working diligently to try to find the money to, to do this bridge, hopefully without a toll, which we've taken a position against. Um, and lastly, to the, to, to the local MPO and to all of us that have worked hard at this, uh, this is not an easy, um, this is not an easy piece of infrastructure to, to replace. And as we have all experienced when they closed it for six months, we know how important that piece of infrastructure is to this entire region. So um, I just want to say thank you to everybody involved. This was a great bipartisan effort uh, to, to really work hard to get this money from at the federal level. So the, so it's begun, and so we've got a lot of work left to do, and uh, I know it'll get done. So thank you very much. And now I'm going to make a motion, or somebody's going to make a motion, that we go into, into, into a closed session pursuant to the provisions of North Carolina General Statute Section 143-318.11A1A6 in order for the City Council to, one, prevent the disclosure of information that is privileged, confidential, or not considered a public record pursuant to North Carolina General Statute 132, and two, consider the performance of public officers or employees appointed by the city council. The closed session will be held in council chambers, and I'm gonna ask everyone after we take this vote to leave the chambers at this time, and at the end of the closed session, council will reopen its public session and adjourn at that time. So I have a motion. Oh, motion. We yeah. have a motion made by Mayor Pro Tem, well, we're gonna say Council Member Salette Andrews, all right, seconded second. by Mayor Pro Tem Barnett. All in favor of that motion, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Item passes unanimously. We will now go into closed session, and we'll please ask for the room to be cleared. Thank you.